How are you? Good. How are you? Just woke up from like a three hour nap. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, willing to do this. No problem, man. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for reaching out. This is the first uh, any kind of press you've done, right? Since I got that role, I've had like four or five people reach out to me, but this is the first we've done done. Okay. And, you know, you know what I mean? I was moving. I moved from LA to Mission Viejo like a day ago. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why it took me so long to think of that. Um, but uh, so I didn't have any internet or anything like that. So this is our first test of the whole system, the whole shebang. So, All right. Yeah. How how are you? How's your how's your day? Good. Oh, good. Um, yeah, I had another interview before this, so I kind of figured that uh, I would just ask the, if it would work. So I'm glad that it did. That's fair. Yeah, it worked. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just start from the beginning then, and um, you can say what your origin story is. <laughs> My villain origin story. Yeah, sure. I'm from California, though... Uh, a military family so um we moved around i didn't move around as much as like most military kids but yeah i'll just say i'm from california yeah. okay i'm from socal specifically like san clemente area and was it um always voice acting specifically that you wanted to try and pursue or just acting in general no <laughs> not even acting oh um yeah no i got into it because i was uh I was at college and I was in my third year, second semester, and I had taken a performance class, like a theater performance, uh, speaking, do these PowerPoints X, Y, and Z class. And the teacher was a theater professor. His name is David Ruiz. And uh, David was like, you know what? You'd be good for this show. Why don't you audition? I think it was because they didn't have enough people to audition for the show. Um, and so he's like, please God, anyone come and audition for me um but so i auditioned and i got cast in a different show <laughs> that they were putting on that season and i'd never done any acting before i had never done any voice acting in general um and then from that show it was sycorax which is an adaptation of shakespeare's the tempest and uh from that show i sort of fell headfirst into the theater world at the University of Kansas where I went. You know, I only had about a year and a half left at school. So I only had three shows to do. But it was so much fun that I sort of pushed aside my whole graphic design career. <laughs> I was I was studying to be a graphic designer. Okay. Uh, and I did theater until eventually COVID hit. And then once COVID hit, I'm like, how the hell do I still act? and have fun with this career and then i realized that like you know voice acting is a thing and it's something that i grew up on i grew up on uh anime and cartoons and studio ghibli my mom had like a six box set mm -hmm. of studio ghibli uh my favorite was nausicaa of the valley of the wind yeah and um i was like i could try this thing i know there's like a thing called casting call club and yeah. so i did that <laughs> and I did that for like, well, once COVID hit, I graduated uh, in COVID. So that was really strange. Graduating virtually. I don't think I still, I don't think I even have my diploma. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like a year and a half. Uh, and then after all that, uh, I just did voiceover and worked like a packaging job and it was like, I'll work this nine nine to five or some cases midnight to 8 a.m because the hours were wonky and then do voiceover in my free time when i have time uh yeah so that's that's how i sort of roundabout found voiceover i never i gotta say i never even knew voiceover was a thing until i started acting in like like my junior year of college i'm like oh, people are the voices in <laughs> cartoons that's nuts I never thought of it. I never thought of it. So, yeah. And so what was your uh, first, any kind of paid gig that you got with voiceover? My first paid gig? Oof. 
I remember the most because I had a few paid gigs before this, but oh. the most important one was uh, I had just gotten laid off from the print like the print gig. They didn't need me. Uh, the seasonal worker craze was over, and I was freaking out. So I started doing a bunch of auditions that night, and then I heard back the next day that I booked one, and it was for an audiobook. Uh, and that audiobook was able to pay for my rent. Mm. <laughs> so that's that was very nice. Um, and I'd never done anything long form like that before. Uh, but I think the first, yeah, so that, that it's called Dead End Drive. It's by Ian Kirkpatrick. Um, it's like a murder mystery kind of everyone in the house is a killer uh, deal. It was very fun. A huge learning experience. Uh, yeah, so that was my first important paid gig because there were like, you know, other paid gigs before that where it's like you're in this vocal pack as like a little thing that, you know, video gamers can use to make their games that don't have voices have voices. But mm -hmm. it's like 18 bucks and I'm like, that's not going to pay my rent. That's not going to that's hardly going to get me a meal. Yeah. So <laughs> it was that one. Yeah, that is interesting because I think you're probably the first person I've talked to who had their first big job be a audiobook. Was that kind of daunting? Oh my, yeah. <laughs> it was the <laughs> scary, it was the scariest thing. Like, okay, put it in perspective, right? Most voiceover gigs, you get in the session, you're done in like four hours, unless you have a supporting or major character, in which case you go back and back and back until you're done. With audiobooks, it's all you in right. the studio with you know, that book, thankfully, wasn't uh, 350,000 words. It was only 80,000, no, 90,000. But still, it, it was because I didn't have the tools or the skill set necessary to um, create a seamless audio experience for my, on my end, like an audio recording experience. experience. Sorry. Um it ended up taking way longer than it should have. And I was like, no, this sentence isn't perfect. I'm going to re-record that. But I have like 300 more sentences to go for this one chapter of 20. And you're just like, uh, you know, you got to just get it on the first take and move. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. It was very nice. Very, very yeah, I would have. I'm glad I had that as my first experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you think that you have a personal preference in general with acting, uh, with doing dark stuff opposed to lighter stuff? When you say light stuff, dark stuff, are you talking about like comedic versus dramatic? Yeah. Yeah. So comedic is so much fun. Uh, I love doing, I, I'm, I'm this character in a uh, kid's show called Akato. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Cub. Mm -hmm. And Cub is one of the most fun characters I've ever voiced. He's just this exuberant ball of energy that bounces off the walls and all that stuff. But at the same time, I think I lean more towards dramatic because dramatic is real. Mm -hmm. And like comedic is great. It's an escape. I needed that in COVID. But dramatic is where my heart lies, so to speak. I love doing... I don't know, I love just getting intimate and real with the script and going to a place knowing that I have a safety net of directors and assistant directors and engineers to fall back on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the dangers of uh, doing like dr super dramatic scripts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you do a dramatic script and you put like your heart into it, right? But as actors, we are feeling the way we feel, right? We are feeling those emotions. So having a good safety net of people behind you to let you know that it is okay to cry or it is okay to do those things. Acting is a lot like therapy in that instance. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And what do, you, what do you think is the, so far, the single most darkest headspace you've had to get into for a role? <sighs> Rio was pretty dark. Mm -hmm. uh for spirit chronicles 
I don't want to spoil anything, but you know, in the first episode, you see him lose his mom, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I think okay, scratch that because Rio is also kind of like he's a polite boy, all that stuff. Uh, the darkest headspace that I've had to get into for a role was I was performing the show The Christians by Lucas Nath, um, H N A T H is how you spell his last name, and. I played um, the associate pastor in that role. The, the whole show is about like, it's about fighting faith and mm. what is the right way to express your Christianity. And the main pastor believes that um, hell is earth right now and that everybody will go to heaven regardless of your sins, you know, regardless of your, if you're gay, if you're, you know, um, you know, that whole spiel, mm. my character the associate pastor Joshua, he was like, no, absolutely not. Heaven is a place that you can only go to if you repent for your sins here on earth. And hell is a truly real thing. And the reason why that role was so hard was because very similar to Rio, but it was like in, in the last 20 minutes of the show, I have a 14 page monologue. Wow where I'm talking about my dead mom and how I watched her die in mm-hmm. front of me and how I watched her get dragged into hell and how I never saw her again. And she didn't believe in Christ. She didn't believe in Jesus. Now I'm, uh, I'm not really Christian or anything like that, but it was this whole idea of permanency. Mm-hmm. I have lost her forever. I cannot meet her in the afterlife because I, as a pastor, am going up to heaven. Mm-hmm. I am doing my work as God's, you know, servant. And my mom willfully neglected the faith in her time of need, and she's going to hell. And I will always be looking down at her, watching her suffer for the rest of eternity. Mm-hmm. And to then take that, like, 15 minute monologue and perform it in front of my mom because my mom flew in uh when i was at the university of kansas she's moved she moved to north carolina a military family but she flew in for this one performance because it was important to me and she knew it was important to me and uh to perform it in front of my mom it's just yeah that's the hardest thing i've ever like had to do acting wise oh yeah yeah i had a great director for that he um you know i talked about that safety net earlier uh the safety net was um because there was a there was a time in the audition not the audition but in the the, uh, rehearsal where i just lost it in the sense of like i couldn't control my emotions i was just crying and bawling and trying to get through my script but i couldn't um and, you know, like, as, as goofy as it is, it's just word words on a fucking page, right? Sorry, can I cuss? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> it's just words on a page, you know? But, like, in, in that moment, it was so real to me, and it was the first time I'd ever experienced anything like that, where I'm crying off of my own imagination. Right. And my director's like, mm, don't go that far, or if you do, we need to talk about it. We need to sit down for two hours and just discuss what's going through your mind. So that way you aren't permanently hurt by the role that you are portraying. So if that's the hardest role that I've had to play so far mm-hmm. is uh, uh, Associate Pastor Joshua in a theater production. Okay. So, yeah. And everybody else I've talked to, it seems like, they have certain processes to get out of a headspace like that. Is there anything that you do specifically? Mm-hmm. Um, one is you take a step back, you know, like a painter a painting their easel, they're in it for so long and then you have to take a step back to see the whole picture, right? You need to take a step back and understand, process the emotions that you're feeling. And the other is to seek for help. Mm-hmm. If you are truly stuck in a headspace like that because of you know choices that your character makes you know you need to be able to rely on either if you have a director your director if you're going off of a writer talk to your writer 
if you don't have anybody in your team, talk to your mom or your dad or your sibling, you know, or your friends. Mm -hmm. you, you just gotta... I think that's why a lot of people do acting is acting is like therapy in an instance. It's a way to express your emotions. It's an art form. When you're in a headspace like that, don't don't make your friends your therapist, but lean on your friends. Mm -hmm. They will they will gladly help you if yeah you're in that space. And I guess uh, in terms of voiceover, I know um, would certain aspects of Rio be the darkest voiceover thing that you have you've done? Yeah, it it, it would be the darkest voiceover work that I have done so far. Because um, <clears throat> I mean, to be fair, I haven't done a lot of voiceover work. You know, in the grand scheme of things, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little, little fish in a really, really big pond. Mm -hmm. And so Rio, not necessarily by default, but he is the darkest character I've had to voice so far. I think in, I mean, in session, I think it was session seven um we did a few sessions uh by a few i mean like 10 mm. or 12 to record the entire show and there's a moment where uh i can't i don't want to spoil it man i don't want to spoil it but all i can say is that something happens to someone he cares about mm -hmm. and it's not just a light little thing it's very heavy and he does some really I mean, drastic things call for drastic measures, whatever that saying is. And so he has to get, I have to get into that really dark headspace of like, I'm okay with this. I'm okay doing what I am doing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, not to spoil, I'm not going to spoil anything, but okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the subs out there, if you're interested, you can watch the sub, but um, if you're solely focused on the dub then chill you know we'll get there <laughs> You'll, rio is a very dark character mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i wasn't sure about what the timeline was but what the some of the on-camera projects you had was that prior to voiceover um yeah so i did a lot of theater work i was gonna go into on camera and move to la and do that whole shindig <laughs> And then COVID happened and mm. on-camera stuff just stopped. Whatever projects I had lined up fell to the wayside and now I'm sitting in my room eating pizza doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, like uh, I was, I'm so sad because I think the, the festival is now uh, defunct. But I was going to do, once I graduated, I got accepted into the Great River Shakespeare Festival oh. as a uh, understudy, actor, performer kind of type. I think there were like 600 people who auditioned and only 20 people who got in. So I was pretty stoked about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> then COVID hit and I'm like, no, my, my dream is a failure. Everything's <laughs> going to shit, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, on camera stuff fell to the wayside once voiceover work happened, and then, well, you know, here we are. Mm -hmm. And so I know um, one of the first things or like major things uh, would have been uh, been Nori and Zen. Yeah, I haven't. I to be honest, I haven't even recorded for that yet. Oh, you haven't? <laughs> no. Okay. No. I I remember though. I do remember getting cast in it. Because that was my first time meeting Patrick and crew, and it was really my first major gig mm -hmm. um, on on the Twitter space. Before that, I had mainly audiobooks under my name, a few vo video games here and there, a commercial here and there. Um, but bef and then when that hit, people were like, "Oh, who is this kid? Why do you think you deserve this role?" Mm -hmm. You know, people messaging me on Twitter and whatnot, and. It was it was on New Year's Eve. I remember that because <laughs> I had been drinking with some friends up and we got an Airbnb in North Dakota. Oh. And uh, it was really fun. It was a good time. There was only like eight of us and we were isolated. The snow was 
packed in, but I still had cell service and I, my phone's blowing up and my Twitter's like popping off and stuff like that. And then I'm like, I got cast as this character. I got cast as this character. What? You know, it definitely gave me that like casting high, like, yes, yes. (laughs) But I haven't even recorded for it yet. It's still in production. I think uh, they just dropped, they just dropped episode one. I should be appearing in, I don't want to say anything, but I should be in appear, appearing in episode two. So mm, okay. I will record for it at some point <laughs> in the future. Yeah. <laughs> and so what was your experience with um, being involved in Fallout? The Fallout project? That was my, if we're talking about first projects I ever got cast in, that was the first project I ever got cast in. Oh, okay. It was, uh, I think his name is Wei, W-E-I, in Fallout. And um, the director was so specific. I remember that. I remember, I because I was recording in Audacity at the time on a blue snowball microphone in a coat closet where I had to make sure I could, I, I had to make sure I couldn't get fat, <laughs> like physically me, so I could fit into my little coat closet. Like I had, you know, coat closets this big, I took up this much of the space. The computer screen took up this much of the space. Mm-hmm. And the, the other half. Like, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> so I remember being in that space, just reading the lines, like, super stiff like that. And uh, it was an amazing experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, the director was super specific, so it was the first time really getting thrown to the wind. And I'm sort of forced to output more than, you know, I thought mm. needed to be output, but I understood the reason why when it came up. So yeah, that was my first project. It was really cool. Mm-hmm. And what was uh, Splinter City? Ah, ah, <laughs> Splinter <laughs> City. That's, um, so I voiced a character named Jacob Harris, uh, Ryan Bell, who is a, uh, now an email friend of mine, I guess I would say. Uh, I got cast in that. Jacob is a um, very, if you're wanting to talk about headspaces, he's a very interesting headspace. Mm. Um, he's super internal. And it's basically the whole point, like, I think, I think the whole plot of Splinter City is that people's original characters go to Splinter City to fight. Mm. Um and so Jacob Harris is a splinter, you know, kid. He had made his own magical scarf that, like, poof, I want to cosplay because he looks so cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's he he was really interesting because I got to act alongside some other folks that were, you know, like Michael Kovac and uh, my friend Griffin Puatu. It was weird too because Jacob has you know he's from Northern. England, right? He's sort of mumbling all the, all the time. Um, he's very uh, in, um, internal. Mm-hmm. And so it's a weird part of my voice. It's a weird, ac- it's not a weird accent. It's a unique and different accent. And uh, it's a weird character process. And honestly, he's, he's become one of my favorite characters. I actually mm-hmm. based him off of my significant other. Oh, <laughs> when, when they're sleeping, when, when they're sleepy, they sort of they sort of just talk like this. I'm like, yeah, I could do that, but just put a northern northern British spin on it, and we're good to go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so that's Splinter City. I did see on your resume, touching on that, based off what you said, uh, that looks like that you can do a lot of uh, different accents. Yeah. Um, actually, that's one of the reasons why I got cast in my last performance before COVID hit, um, was I got to play Touchstone and Shakespeare's As You Like It, uh, with a Russian accent. Mm -hmm. Um, so imagine like ye old Shakespearean English and then tack on a Russian accent to that. It's, um, it was a really weird character. I did the best I could. Um, but I can do, I can do a fair bit of accents. I mean, you're doing voiceover work. You gotta be able to do the accents that specifically fit to who you are. So for me, I studied, you know, 
uh, British, Scottish, Irish, uh, French, German. Um, I suck at German mm. and Russian, you know. Uh, and you'll hear people who say, like, you won't get cast if you don't have the authentic accent. That's not true. That's not true entirely. I get cast using accents all the time. Mm-hmm. One of my first projects, I got cast using an old man voice, like dialects and, and, and changing your voice a bit. It's, it's really key to doing voiceover. And especially, you know, especially if you have the opportunity to explore your heritage. Like mm-hmm. I got to learn about, you know, Irish and Scottish culture and uh you know realize that there's there's a lot of things that come with it besides the accent there's history to it and a reason why they spoke like that mm-hmm. you know i did think of accents yeah well I did, I did think it was interesting too um that it said that you can do uh like little little boy voices on your thing too yeah, i mean that's i mean that's cub man like yeah. I sort of hopped into it there, right? Here's my voice naturally, which is like a 16 year old teenage boy, right? But then if I pitch it up a little bit, we're right there. We got a little, you know, and then if you do a little kid voice, you sort of get into that head space of, you know, you're thinking through things and then, oh, I got an idea, you know? Um, <laughs> it's, it, that's what Cub is in a Kato, uh, is, he's all the way up here right he's like whoa um (laughs) i mean he's 13 that's how i was when i was 13 most little boy voices especially in anime are done by um people who have a more feminine voice because they can get they can get like that childlike rasp in there right think of like um killua from hunter hunter um any any of the kids from hunter hunter honestly any of the kids naruto (laughs) you know they're all voiced by uh uh, female voices and um so uh i've met a few people who can do like a can like of course my young boy voice is like super cartoony it's not realistic in Mm -hmm. any way and i fully acknowledge that uh what they do is something i could never do or could only do if I took like 10 years to try and master it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, young boy voices are wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think generally to, uh, is the case where you've altered your voice the most for something? Jacob is up there in my audiobooks. I have to alter my voice all the time. Right. I actually, I'm working for a company right now called, uh, we hear, and they do a lot of like, I don't want to say anything bad. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff written on there. Okay. And a lot of the audiobooks or the books on there are from a female point of view. And if I'm the, if I'm the chosen narrator, I have to convey that female point of view. And I could speak in my normal voice, you know, audiobooks can have that but i try and always add a touch of femininity femininity to my tone so when i have like a female tone it's kind of up here right it's not really that much different but it's a little more airy a little more breathy and when you're talking about like change for uh extended periods of time i have to narrate in that tone for hours Mm -hmm hours and hours and hours i just finished a 350,000 word audiobook with i mean she's up here she's her name is emily right mm-hmm. so yeah my goal one of my goals <laughs> one of my goals is to voice an old grandma oh. i want to voice an old grandma so bad <laughs> <laughs> I play Dungeons and Dragons and old people. I put a bunch of old people in my campaign because they all sort of talk like this and it's very fun, you know. (laughs) So if I ever get cast in an old grandma, that's the most uh, I'll have to like do to change my voice. It's really weird. Like, okay, my original goal before Rio was to book a lead in an anime. Mm -hmm. I want to do that, right? 
everyone wants to do that. And I'm so blessed that I had the opportunity to do that. And hopefully I will in the future. Right. (sighs) And, you know, thank you to Brittany Lauda and, you know, uh, Mike, my director, he's become a really good friend. And (sighs) now I'm like, well, what's my next goal? Mm. Right. What's the next step? Because I sort of hit that way before I expected to. Mm-hmm. You know, I expected to get cast in an anime as a lead after putting in my 25 Funimation credits. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like, I have other anime stuff in the works. I can't really talk about any of it because NDA, NDA, NDA. Um, but as a lead, as my first, like, public anime thing, it was kind of bonkers. So my next goal is to book an old grandma. That's mm-hmm. coming in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, if it, you know, because I have a superstition where like I have my goals that I keep to my chest and then I have the goals I present to everyone else um, because the goals that I keep to my chest are the ones that are like, you know, getting a grandma would be really funny. It's cute. <laughs> it's <laughs> all that stuff it's not my only goal for 2022 by far. I have plenty of other things I want to, I have plenty of other things I want to do. And so uh, regarding the, the story of how you got Rio, did you want to, cause I know we hadn't really talked about the story yet. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, man, let's talk about it. What was, uh, was it just like a normal audition that you uh, submitted? <sighs> no. <laughs> i mean all auditions are kind of their own little their own little like micro world so Mm. to speak you are that character for however long it takes you to do that audition and now i had auditioned for this company coach of sound in the past um and i didn't get it from any agents or anything like that and so i wanted and i had copious time so I wanted to perfect it, you know, which is not what I generally uh, suggest. Mm-hmm. But over three day period, this is this makes me sound like a lunatic. I thought about that audition when I ate breakfast. I thought about that audition when I uh, went for my morning run. I thought about that audition um, because I wanted to give them something iconic Mm -hmm. and i was very lucky to have you know friends who could possibly listen to auditions and uh give me crucial feedback on what they're hearing it was a it was a tedious 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 process Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) and i did not think that i was going to get cast as rio um i was like they're not going to cast me as they're going to cast someone who deserves to be cast in this role because i don't deserve it getting that getting that email back it was really funny they screwed up they cast me as miharu at first (laughs) you know yeah so i was like guys i didn't audition for miharu and i have kind of a a male a masculine tone so if you, I mean, I could do feminine voices, but you don't want that for the entire show. Trust me. <laughs> and they're like, no, we, we screwed up on our end. It's okay. You're, you're real. I'm like, what? You're real. What? Are you kidding? No, Mm-mm. that's fake. That's fake. I had, to, I had to like confirm it. Like, you're kidding me. Like, did you screw up again? Like, I should be cast as like male student B. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) what were the what were your first impressions of um this character and how could you like personally relate to him he's very kind you know but at the same time there is also something that ticks Mm -hmm. in him right so how is he able to control himself when he gets bullied how is he able to keep his head up and his chin held high and his chest out and puffed and have this sense of pride, you know? And so first impressions of Rio were, 
how am how how am I supposed to be brave in the face of everything the world kind of being against you mm -hmm. right everyone has treated you as the enemy everyone has treated you as the outsider the villain the rat you know and so like literally one of rio's first things is he gets tortured right like by my good friend blythe <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny blythe and i we've been friends for for like a year he was one of the first voiceover friends i made thanks to a friend another friend of mine george peter um and uh blythe and i both booked it's, it was his first anime too mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's kind of nuts that this it, it all came full circle um but you know one of rio's first things is he's getting tortured and he still he has this pride as he's not going to give in you hear stories all the time about people torturing and torturing and doing uh, ridiculously unnecessary things to get what they want to hear so they can move on to the next person right mm -hmm. rio at seven didn't do that at seven he had enough conviction to uh hold out through that entire session Mm -hmm. you know until he basically passed out and he was covered in lacerations and you know bruises and so my first impression of rio was how do i as kieran become brave how do i step up to the plate and be like i i don't think i'm super brave so how do i find that within myself and it was through uh, who Rio cares about that I found that. Mm. Rio cares about his mom. Rio cares about Celia. Rio cares about Latifa. He cares about all of these people in his life. And it's through that need, that need to protect, that need to um, make sure everyone's okay. So but <laughs> i did not discover that in the audition process i can tell you that mm -hmm. <laughs> i had to have mike help me figure it out because i had the i had the like basic concept but i couldn't put it into words you know what i mean yeah and so when i got into like my first session with mike um uh mike and martin martin's the engineer uh we kind of talked about who this character was and what he goes through. I thought that first session I was going to get fired. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm like, you still made a mistake. I don't belong here. <laughs> That's, that was my thought process through the first session. Once, it, once after the first session, though, it was like, nah, dude, we're chill. We're making anime. Mm -hmm. You know, we're making the shit that I grew up on. Right. right? So, like, uh, it, it became so much fun after that, you know? Mm -hmm. so yeah and were there uh other voice actors that primarily did anime that you were like inspired by growing up or yeah um well i i kind of became inspired by voice actors when i discovered that voice actors existed yeah <laughs> so <laughs> if, we're, if we're talking about anime or voice actors that i looked up to um Jason Marsden is one of them. Uh, the voice of Max from the Goofy movie. Mm -hmm. I thought he was so cool. I'm like, I want to be like that. Yeah. You know, I thought he was super cool. One of the first like true anime I watched, as many people, was Sword Art Online. Now everyone mm -hmm. has their opinions on it. But all I can tell you is that 14-year-old no, me stayed up, recorded to my DVR, all of the Sword Art Online episodes from Adult Swim mm -hmm. because I had never seen anything like it before, you know? And so uh, Bryce Pave and Brooke and uh, all those all those people. I mean, honestly, <laughs> Rio is a, looks a lot like Kirito. Mm -hmm. So I find it very, it's again, everything comes full circle, right? Yeah. Um, but then once I discovered that voice actors existed uh there was a whole wellspring of like 
you know, a geyser of inspiration, so to speak. The first being the entire cast of Critical Role. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got into I got into Critical Role because I played Dungeons and Dragons as a teenager. It's weird to say as a teenager. Uh, <laughs> I'm 23, <laughs> but um, Matthew Mercer is a huge inspiration for me. It's so much so that like before I even did voiceover and I was doing graphic design. I designed an entire like TED talk conference for one of my final projects. Uh, and it was all about storytelling. And I made sure to put my, my, my brain vision of Matthew Mercer as one of the speakers, one of the storytellers. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then Laura Bailey and Travis Willingham and just iconic, 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 iconic people that if I ever had the chance to meet, it would take like three three times meeting before I'd stop geeking out and finally be chill. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So those are those are my inspiration right now. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, one of my um my last interviews of twenty twenty one was uh, Michelle Ruff, who was uh Sinan. So oh. Oh wow! Yeah, that's cool, man. You you got a cool job. You got a cool gig. Oh, thanks. I'm just saying, you get to talk to these people. Meanwhile, I'm nervous to say hi on a Twitter DM <laughs> <laughs> because they'll never respond. Yeah, you know, that's cool, man. Oh, no, thank shit. you. Yeah, wow. Well, because I was gonna ask you too if you're becoming friends with um any of the like younger generation LA anime people. Yeah, yep. yeah. Look, I'm just saying. We're coming. We're coming. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's a few of us that I'm like, all right, see us in 10 years. Talk to us then. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and now that might sound cocky and overconfident, but like, it's we're working for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. In this new day and age where rates are, are like lower than they've ever been and, and, you know, ways to pay your house or your rent are higher than they've ever been. Mm-hmm. And so you have to like balance two jobs and voiceover and, you know, a social life and sleep somehow. I think this new generation, um, me included, is uh, going to redefine mm-hmm. um, voiceover as we know it. I mean, look at Arcane. Right. Like, dude, talk about one of the best shows since Avatar The Last Airbender. Yeah. In my mind. I I went to the arcane. I'm not usually this much of a fanboy, but I went to the arcane live show out there in LA, uh, where you got to go into like the undercity and pretend to be a resident of the undercity and you know, steal um the purple goo. I'm blanking on the name. Um slime, slug, something. Mm-hmm. Uh and bring it back to your clan or your or your group, your gang. <clears throat> Arcane is so cool. Mm-hmm. I could go on and on about Arcane. I have the soundtrack playing in my head right now. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And you're also, um, I've been trying to get other uh, LGBT voice actors on uh, my channel as well. And Really? Uh, cool. Yeah. Good. I'm, I'm also gay, so... Uh, what (laughs) that's awesome well you know i am uh something i am currently in a relationship with um uh they them Mm -hmm. and i've been floating the idea of uh using uh they them pronouns but for now sticking with he they and uh i'm i'm gay in some aspects lgbtq is a spectrum Right. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I got my I got my thing right here. Yeah. My mom gave this to me. I know one thing. I am um asexual. Mm. I know that. Uh which do you know what ace is? Or... Yeah. Okay. As some people might should I explain it? Yeah, if you, if you want to do it. Okay. Um ace is basically you don't feel any sexual feelings towards um anybody, really. Uh, well, that's the extreme version of ACE. Now, there are a lot of different ACE, asexualities. It's a spectrum. Right. 
but I am like extreme. <laughs> I don't want that. Um, and when I discovered, I discovered that because uh, uh, my teacher was talking about how sea cucumbers asexually reproduce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I, I Googled asexual and the chat and it came up with Avon online. And then, um, you know, uh, you know, what is, what is, does it mean to be asexual? And like little, like thirteen-year-old me is like, <gasps> what? And then it took about three years for me to actually fully accept that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I am a proud member of the LGBTQ plus community. Do you think that's also a goal, is or maybe just for anime or in general, is to voice a character that's also on that spectrum? Yeah, absolutely. I would. Every time I see an ace character that fits my persona as Kieran, um, mm. my 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 vibe, um, I will audition. I don't care what the pay is. I want to continue that uh, flag. Hold that hold that flag high. Yeah. So yeah. Well, my opinion, I mean, based off the like more feminine voice that you um, displayed, it would have been cool to. If it was dubbed like if it, if it was redubbed earlier or um, or later, that it'd be cool to have heard you in Sailor Moon. Because I think you would have done a really cool job <laughs> as somebody. <laughs> oh, that's so cool! Yeah, there was um before COVID happened again. Before COVID, right before COVID, I got cast in um another theater show for the summer, and I would have been playing a drag queen. Oh. Uh, a gay drag queen in uh, 1940s, um, uh, like, wartime, where all the women have to put on the shows because the men are off the war. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That role, I would have been, I would have lost my mind. That would have been so cool. Yeah. I'm so mad that I didn't play it. But one of these days, one of these days, I will play um, in sh- TV and video game or animation, I will play an open, openly out character that is uh, LGBTQIA+. Mm. I am the A. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. So. So, um, I guess, is there anything else that's upcoming that you can, like, safely talk about, or is it all mostly a secret? Sorry. <laughs> that's why. Uh, let me think. I gotta rack my brain. I guess watch more Spirit Chronicles. In the first episode, I only have like four lines, but then uh, once the, the second episode is out now, it comes out every Monday. Um, <clears throat> and like huge, huge credit to the cast, huge credit to the directors, the team behind the scenes. Uh, they're the ones that really put it together mm-hmm. to make it you know, as good as it is, uh, they they brought some life to that show that I didn't see before. Mm-hmm. And you know, the other thing that the cast had to, the team had to deal with was a lot of the voice actors that were cast in the show. I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of them are new. Yeah, you know what I mean. A lot of them are new, and <clears throat> me included. I'm not going to say anything about that, but it was like, you know, you got to go through, you know, you have to learn how to, um, with each person, you have to kind of teach them the ropes kind of thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because time is, time is money, literally. What you do is like, uh, if you're dubbing, it's just so, it's a challenge because you are supposed to act within the flaps on time. Right. And so say you have like a spur of the moment uh, emotion that you know is going to convey really well. Well, unfortunately, you have to stick to these words or at least these syllables, and you have to hold on to that emotion for another 15 seconds while the engineer sets up the thing. It's just very, it's very challenging. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand how challenging it was until Rio really (laughs) i mean because you know i've thrown like head first into the wind one one little thing that i did to help me was um you know how you know in anime how there's like or in dubbing or prelay 
uh, their beeps, like a doo, right. doo, doo, go. Yep. Um, so one thing that I would do is I'd time it out on my chest. So it's do 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 go, right? Mm-hmm. So that way I have like a physical thing to interact with. But I'd of course make no sound. I wouldn't go like bonk, 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 yeah. you know, because <laughs> then that would ruin the recording. Um, but yeah, so. Your advice might be the same, I would think, as other people, but was is there anybody or anything that you would uh, tell people to, or advice that you'd give for other people that are like around our age that would want to get into this? Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I think I will talk to the people who are like specifically doing it but also doing other things and um it's okay to take a step back it's okay to breathe it's okay to you know take a nap yeah (laughs) (laughs) you uh, while working yourself to the bone will get you pretty far it'll also leave you in a husk Mm -hmm and you don't want to burn out because there are a lot of very talented people out there in this world uh and a lot of people whose stories need to be told but then they get started and then this becomes all consuming and they don't take breaks and it's all they think about until eventually they have no more love for it Mm -hmm. because it's the only thing they think about and at that point it's becoming torture mentally to do so if you're like that <laughs> to the people out there or the people trying to do this profession and you, you really love it, make sure you take a break. Make sure you drink water. Go outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wish I could have told myself. So. I know, of course, your career is just uh, kind of still getting started, but my final question is always asking, what, what do you want your legacy to be? my legacy (laughs) talk about something i haven't considered before i want my legacy to make my mom proud yeah i want i want i want my legacy to make my dad proud i want i want people to see the characters that i'm doing or that i'm performing and take solace in them relate to them live through them Mm -hmm. you know i want my i want my legacy to be one of um hard-fought pride so one of these days (laughs) (laughs) Uh, you know how it is yeah well thanks i'm glad that we uh got to do this yeah man sorry if i talked your ear off Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> I'm naturally a chatty Kathy, so I had a good time. You asked you ask some good questions, so. Oh, yeah. thank you. Mm-hmm. How long have you been doing this? Um, God, uh, started, I think, in, started with Wendy Lee. Do you know, you know who Wendy Lee is? I know Wendy Lee, yeah. Yeah, uh, started, basically started with her, um, like, last October, or October of 2020. And then, um, yeah, kind of just snowballed. From there, like with Yuri Lowenthal, Tara Platt, and mm-hmm. people like, yeah, just really mostly bigger anime people. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm a small one and I will <laughs> try and make myself as interesting as possible. Yeah, <laughs> well, I do you do voice acting too? I mean, if you're interviewing a bunch of voice actors, you must have some interest in the field and in that respect. Well, I mean, I did go to it wasn't conventional school but I, I did go to like college for it here um so oh really yeah no shit <laughs> that's cool as hell i i mean i didn't go through it the conventional means any either <laughs> i learned voice acting i was all self-taught are you are you from minnesota you're up in minnesota yeah yeah where are you around where where are you in minnesota yeah oh, it's where are you in Mi- like i'm like outside of minneapolis pretty much no shit uh i have family right outside of minneapolis oh that's yeah cool. i go up there it's it must be cold there right now Sheesh. yeah it's awful <laughs> yeah yikes i don't miss it i just moved from kansas so mm-hmm. i uh i got i got like 
I would say like, you know, half of what you're experiencing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Minnesota winters are no freaking joke, dude. Does anybody ever go, oh, for Pete's sake, how you doing there, Bob? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear it in your voice, so I don't know if you've been working on that, but shit. Nice. <laughs> are you looking to stay in Minneapolis for an extended period of time or are you looking to move out here and do voiceover or like what's your what's your what's your want mm, i don't know i mean it would i obviously like i like i like doing this uh yeah i'd be happy if it was just the interview stuff i guess for because i i mean I, at first i wanted to try and do voiceover as well but um this kind of just happened and it's like a main thing now so i'm fine but if it's just doing interviews i guess I mean, interviews, it's it's one of the reasons why I want to get into directing at some point in my life. Okay. Uh, it's because you're part of the process. Even it's 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 scratching that itch. Right. That just I want to be in the room. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so when you get to talk to people like Yuri Lowenthal, Tara Platt, or uh, you know, if you ever get Matthew Mercer on the line, like if you if you talk to people like that it's kind of that same i'm here with you i'm scratching my voice over itch so mm -hmm. i totally understand that yeah yeah well thanks this was uh i'm glad that i got to be your first <laughs> <laughs> yeah man that's great <laughs> <laughs> sorry that was a crass joke no, uh <laughs> well no i mean it was it was a good first interview <laughs> Woo! now we'll see what the what the youtube people have to say about my fucking uh this thing i wonder if anybody's gonna say anything about this i hope they do what does that mean <laughs> i was gonna ask you this yeah does that ah, dude, no i just think it looks like the looks like the early 2000s uh, McDonald's like oh, the cup. squiggly art <laughs> the yeah. cup shit and I'm like this is a core part of my memories McDonald's soda fountains yeah <laughs> I don't usually like vibe this much with other people I interview so cool <laughs> I have been told that my if you play D&D I've been told that my charisma is high so oh, yeah yeah it's the only high stat I have, I swear to God. <laughs> Everything else is just like, well, thanks, man. Hopefully you get some good rest. It's getting pretty late there, so. Well, it's only 9.30, but. Uh, That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. It's it's wind down time or wind up. I don't know what your sleep schedule is. <laughs> yeah. You kind of seem, okay, you, you kind of seem, I'm going to cast you. You seem like the, uh, uh, hmm. Yeah, okay, you seem like the person that stays up late, that, uh, you know, I feel like you'd be the anti-hero. That's what I, that's what I cast you as, is the okay. anti-hero. Yeah. yeah, that's not, you're not the first person, so. <laughs> mm, very anti-hero energy. Okay. I apparently give off lead protagonist in an anime energy, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. Or goofy sidekick. Well, thanks. All right, man. Yeah. Well, thank you. This was a blast. Yeah. All right. I'll catch you later. Okay. Okay. See ya. Bye.